Okay, there's that familiar recording in progress, uh, little voice. So I hope everybody's doing okay, another week. Hopefully you're ready for the Soviet experiment about uh, when communism first came to Russia. So this class is scheduled for August the 30th, okay, and the 21st, which we all know is a Monday. So again, I hope everybody's doing well and uh, I'll proceed with the lesson, okay? So let me move to the material. And we know we gotta get me out of here. Okay, let me push myself out of the way. So uh, I guess I can go from the beginning. Another likes to, to hide. So again, World Civilizations too. I didn't tell you about week eight, right? I was just saying it's August 30th. And we should be good, good to go. Hopefully the summer is winding down. All right. So again, I'll do the little sidebar at the end. All right. uh, the Soviet experiment to World War II. So that means obviously it happened uh, prior. Uh, one of the chief, which means major, byproducts of World War I was a radical experiment in social organization, right? Which is organizing your people and your society that seized or took over Russia and was destined, which comes from destiny, to last for 75 years until the wall fell down. Remember Ronald Reagan saying, Khrushchev, not Khrushchev, but uh, Gorbachev, bring down that wall. In 1917, the Russian Marxists took advantage of the disruptions, resentments, and weaknesses caused by the war to carry out revolution. The first socialist state, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, was born under the watchful eye of a handful of ambitious, which means people that had a lot of things they wanted to accomplish, visionary men around Vladimir I. Lenin, the father of communist Russia. Their communist government, which probably called itself the realization of Marx's dictatorship of the proletariat, and Marx was Karl Marx, who wrote the book on socialism, um, was a frightening phenomenon. Phenomenon means some kind of thing that you can't believe is happening, and many times can't describe it completely to most of the rest of the world. But everywhere, some men and women were inspired by its example and wished to imitate it in their own countries during the interwar period. The March Revolution, 1917. What had set the stage for this radical upheaval? Yeah, what was it? Well, by 1917, the imperial government of Russia had been brought to the point of collapse by the demands of total war. So making war with other people is a very expensive thing to do. So with the war that they had uh, been involved in, World War I, uh, it made them almost completely bankrupt. 12 years later, an aborted, which means they did not follow through on it, Revolution had finally brought, so we're at the bottom. Uh, let me do the sidebar and then I have one little question here for you, which is I think uh, important. So sidebar, 1917, March, October revolutions. Those are big uh, uh, revolutions you should know. But as long as you know the month, it should be easy to remember. 1918, Treaty of 
Brett Litov Litovsk, Civil War Begins. You don't have to worry about that Russian name. 1921, New Economic Policy. 1927, Stalin emerges or comes forth as leader. That's old. Joseph Stalin. 1928, first five-year plan begins, and we will get into Stalin's five-year plan. Then 1936 to 1938, the Great Purge, which we don't have to get into. We have enough material. So, uh, new share, whiteboard, okay, pencil. Name the first socialist state. Just give me the name of the country. Which country are we talking about? Mexico? K-Town? Papoima? So let me give you a, a bit on that. You guys doing okay? Like I said, I'm only asking you for one there. Okay. All right, you should be able to get that. Again, it's probably, the answer is probably Hollywood. Okay, let me grab the eraser, repeating, name the first socialist state, name the country that first became the first socialist country. Okay. Let me share, back to the material. We ended on the bottom here, finally brought, okay? Finally brought a constitution and the elements of modern parliamentary government to the Russian people. Again, prior to that, they were under the king or czar. But the broadly democratic aims of the revolution in 1905 had been frustrated by a combination of force, violence, and guile, guile is like a really strong, sneaky skill. And the czar maintained an autocratic grip on the policy-making machinery as the war began. So as a World War I began, uh, there wasn't many people besides the czar or king that was making decisions. No, again, no democracy, no Congress. In the opening years of World War I, the Russians suffered huge casualties, which means many, many Russians died and lost extensive territory to the Germans and the Austrians. Their generals were the least competent of all the belligerents. So it does speak well. It means the Russian army generals were really, really, really low level, not top notch uh, army folks. The czar's officials were unable or unwilling to enlist popular support for the conflict. And what that means is that World War I um, was not a popular war for Russian people. Sometimes a war is popular. You're defending your country from invaders, you know, or you believe in the, the, the fight, right? Uh, Nazis had not invaded the United States, but the United States entered World War II because um, they believed in the cause of Western Europe fighting the Nazis, right? Okay, so continuing. Um, as the wartime defeats and mistakes piled up, the maintenance of obedience became impossible. By spring 1917, the food supply for the cities was becoming tenuous or risky and bread riots were breaking out. So people were rioting because they weren't getting enough bread. Finally, the demoralized, which means without hope, troops or soldiers refused to obey orders from their superiors. 
Felt pretty bad with the army there. With no prior planning, no bloodshed, and no organization, the March Revolution of 1917 simply came about when the unpopular and confused Tsar Nicholas II suddenly abdicated or gave up his throne or kingship. A committee of the Duma, the parliament, which had been ignored and almost powerless until now, moved into the vacuum thus created and took over the government of Russia. So they were running the show now, not uh, the czar. The Duma co co committee, which called itself the provisional government intended to create a new democratic constitution and hold a free elections as soon as possible. Again, you don't elect the king, king just kind of, at least with that point, that family had ruled for hundreds of years. So the family just continues the line and uh, you just have to accept that that family is not going anywhere. The new government was a, was a weak foundation on which to attempt to build a democratic society. So uh, it was very weak, even though they wanted to replace the king, they themselves were not strong. It had no mandate from the people, but it simply appointed itself. So again, they took it upon themselves to take power. They also were not voted in. They just kind of said, hey, you'll like us better. So just accept it. Uh, leadership soon passed into the hands of Alexander Kerensky, a moderate non-Marxist socialist who had little understanding of the deaths of the people's anti-war mood. So he didn't really understand how deep the Russian citizens felt uh, that they did not want to support the war. The peasants, which is the poor people, about 80% of the population, there you go, 80%, were desperately tired of this war, whose aims they had never understood and which they hated because it was devouring their sons, which means as the war went on, it was killing more and more young men Russian men and the mothers said, we're losing our sons. Wasn't uh, uncommon for them to say, I've already lost three sons. If peace were not soon achieved, they would refuse to grow and ship food to the cities and the Russian government of any kind must collapse. So that's interesting If they stopped doing that. I, the, the communists themselves would have went out. So who would have taken over? It's very interesting. Uh, but Kerensky thought that Russia dare not make a separate losing peace despite the ominous tide of discontent. So ominous is very, very strong. He believed that only a victorious peace would allow the newborn Russian democracy to survive. And he was therefore determined to keep Russia in the war. So keep on fighting and then we will somehow have some kind of great democracy. At least that was his belief. So um, I have a question in there. I think I need the pencil. Let's see. Oh, first let me correct the spelling. I, I, I'm using two C's like in Russian. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, let me see if I can make this a one Z. Yay. Okay. What was the March Revolution of 1917? So just tell me what it is, what how it started, and exactly what it is. So I think I just read and you should be able to easily answer that. So let me give you a few.
Okay, you got that? All right. There we go. Go back. Material. There we go. So now I'll move on to the Bolsheviks. Uh, the people's war weariness, which weariness is a form of being extremely tired, opened the way for the uncompromising communists. See here comes the communists or Bolsheviks. Could that be a question? What's the other name for communists in Russia? Bolsheviks, uh, led by the brilliant tactician, which means strategy, army style, Vladimir Lenin, which I mentioned before, was the father of Russian communism. Before the spring of 1917, Lenin had been a refugee from his native island. I mean, native land, sorry. Maybe I want to go to an island. Living in Swiss and German exile for 20 years. Plotting, which means planning, and propagandizing incessantly. Incessantly means without being tired. For the triumph of the socialist revolution. He was a leader of a movement that had perhaps 100,000 members and sympathizers in the entire Russian imperial population of 160 million. So as you see, like any government strive for struggle, when people usually hear that, they're like, well, it's only 100,000. I mean, there's 160 million Russians, but you know what happened, didn't matter that there was so little compared to the society itself. Here's a photo here. We're actually a drawing. The Communist Party meeting. There's Lenin right here. Uh, although a Marxist, Lenin differed from Marx on the importance of, as he saw it, of a committed, professionally led party to the success of a workers' revolution. Here he is portrayed with Trotsky standing left, Leon Trotsky, and a meeting of the Bolshevik Party. Under Lenin's ages, the Bolsheviks had charged, or sorry, changed Marx to a great deal to make its ideas fit with the Russian reality. And if you read your history, you'll find out later, for example, when uh, Chairman Mao brought communism to China, he said, well, we have to change the Russian uh, way of doing things for the Chinese realities. So most of these folks, when they bring in communism to their countries and Marxism, based on Marxism, they say, well, we got to change it to our style because we have a different culture. <coughs> Excuse me. Then it insisted on a full-time professional leadership supervising a conspiratorial, which means there was a lot of conspiracies or scandals, and clandestine party, which means clandestine means very, very secret. Unlike Marx, he believed that such a party could hasten the coming of the revolution and that the peasantry could be led into revolutionary action. So he thought maybe he could brainwash all the peasants. Remember, now that's different, 80% of the population. So if he could brainwash them, then they'll fight the revolution for him. Lenin thought that in a country such as Russia, where the urban workers class was a, most about 5% of the population in 1910, only a movement that galvanized or brought together peasant discontent stood a chance of success. Lenin was clear uh, that the vague dictatorship of the proletariat that Marx had talked about would quickly become a dictatorship of the Bolsheviks. Within that party, a small group around Lenin called the Central Committee would rule in fact. That was his plan. The Bolshevik uh, leader returned to Russia immediately after the March Revolution, when the new government, anxious to display its democratic credentials, allowed total freedom to all political groups. Through the summer of 1917, Lenin and the provisional government under Kerensky dueled for power, which means they fought for power. The chosen arena was the Soviets or councils of workers and soldiers, which had formed all over Russia. 
uh, chairing the supremely important St. Petersburg Soviet was Leon Trotsky. Uh, Lenin's dynamics second in command who was able to lead the body into the Bolshevik camp. Mm. Persuasion. In the short term, the fate of the country would necessarily be determined by which group could secure the allegiance of the armed forces. So which um, group could have the brotherhood of the army would have the power. The Imperial Army had been disintegrating since the spring with mass desertions commonplace. The peasant soldiers hated the war and a wide cleft or hole had been opened between them and their middle and upper class officers. Into this rift, Bolshevik pacifist and revolutionary propaganda was pouring and finding a ready audience. So smart, Lenin said, hey, we want peace and we don't want any more fighting. So that makes people want to go to your side or vote for you. Kerensky decided to accede or give in to the demands of his hard pressed allies in the West and gamble everything on an ill-prepared summer offensive or attack, which was soon turned into a rout by the Germans counterattack. By September, the enemy was at the gates of St. Petersburg and the army was visibly collapsing. The cities were on the point of mass starvation and the peasants were taking the law into their own hands and dividing up estates of their helpless landlords much as their French counterparts had done a century and a quarter earlier. Okay. So I'm on to the October Revolution. So uh, I have two questions in the Bolshevik arena. Okay. Let me get to those. Question three, very straightforward question. Yeah, I think I can make this a onesie. How did the Bolsheviks change Marxism? Okay, that's the first one. Add one more. You guys got lucky, I was kind. The first ones only had one question each. So we gotta go back to the usual two for content. Here's another straightforward and easy one. This is an easy stretch. All right, what was the October Revolution? Again, just tell me what it was, how it started, the, base, the basics of it, that's it. Okay, go ahead, good luck to you.
hope you guys are handling the heat. It's not easy again this summer. I think another maybe Indian summer. Wow. You guys almost finished on that too. They're not hard. It's a pretty cool questions this week compared to last week's, which were, oh my God, they're tiring for me. There were some long ones. All right, I get the eraser. So how did the Bolsheviks change Marxism? So I've had some funny guys in the past. Are you talking about Maxim coffee? I think they put extra cream. No, Marxism. Okay, four, what was the October Revolution? I've had some other funny students say things like, wasn't that October 31st, Halloween? Is that the October Revolution? No. Okay, back to the material. We're just starting freshly the October Revolution. So let's get into it. By mid-October, Lenin had convinced a hesitant, which means cautious, Central Committee that the time for armed revolutionary action was at hand. So it's time now, he says, we gotta take the country by fighting. He insisted that the brilliantly simple Bolshevik slogans of all power to the Soviets and land, bread, and peace would carry the day despite the tiny number of Bolsheviks, right? Again, he feels, you know, if you have a large number and they're not really motivated at a high level, they can be beaten by a smaller force that is highly motivated to get the peace they want get the food they want and get some free land. I mean, you know, if somebody says, hey, you know, let me ask you, would you fight hard if we win and I give you your neighbor's nice house? And a lot of people would say, hells yeah. You know? On the evening of October 26, old style, don't worry about that. November 6th by the modern calendar, not important. The Bolsheviks used their sympathizers amongst the workers and soldiers in St. Petersburg to seize or take over government headquarters. That's where it was in St. Petersburg, just like Washington, D.C., capital, and take control of the city. The great October revolution of the Soviet folklore was in fact a coup d'etat that cost only a few hundred lives to topple a government that as Lenin had insisted, had practically no support left among the people. In the next few weeks, Moscow and other major industrial towns followed St. Petersburg by installing Bolshevik authorities after engaging in various amounts of armed struggle in the streets. What about the 80% of the population outside the cities? For several months, the countryside remained almost untouched by these urban events, with one exception, the villages the peasants took advantage of the breakdown of government to seize or take the land they had long craved from the hands of the nobles and the church. For the peasants, the redistribution of land from absentee lawyers to themselves was the beginning and the end of revolution. Uh, of Marxist theory about collectivization of agriculture, they knew and wanted to know nothing at all. That's interesting. They knew and wanted to know nothing at all. So that's kind of like saying, well, we know you're killing people over there and stealing, but we don't wanna know, so we don't know. 
Lenin moved swiftly to establish the Bolshevik dictatorship, both using armed force and the massive confusion that had overtaken all levels of Russian government after October. By December, large economic enterprises of all types were being confiscated and put under government supervision. The first version of the dreaded political police, right, the KGB, KGB, was called the Cheka and had been formed and was being employed against various enemies. The remnants or what was left of the Imperial Army were being Bolshevized and turned into a weapon for use against internal opponents, which means its own citizens. Okay, so I have a question uh, in that. Again, I'm shooting, I'm shooting from the hip here. Check something really quick. Be accurate, like I said. Maja. Okay, there we go. Or like I said, shooting from the hip, straightforward Louis. So what was the October Revolution? Describe it, folks. Tell me what it was. Like I said, was it? Uh, uh, what was it, uh, Halloween? Yeah. OK. I don't think so, not October 31st. You think you, you think you got that? I hope so. Okay. If the eraser again, what was the October Revolution? If you want to say trick or treat, be my guest. Let me share. Move on to the Civil War. It's getting a little chilly in here, so I'm going to turn up the air con. You know, it gets hot and cold all the time. I don't know what's going on half the time. So here we go. Civil War against heavy opposition from his own associates. Lenin insisted that Russia must make immediate peace with the Germans and the Austrians. His rationale or reasoning proved to be correct. A civil war against the many enemies of Bolshevism was bound to come soon. Yes. And the party could not afford to still be fighting a foreign foe when it did. So in other words, all these people that said, hey, we don't like this communism crap. It's doing a lot of bad things here. Uh, he needed all his Bolsheviks to be ready to fight them and not be involved in fighting a foreign war with other countries. In March 1918, the Arch Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed with the Central Powers. The collapse of the Central Powers eight months later made this treaty a dead letter. By that time, the Bolshevik Reds were engaged in a massive and very bloody civil war. See, it came, he was correct which was to last two and a half years and cause about as many Russian deaths that had occurred in World War I. 
the Reds won this conflict for several reasons. They were far better organized and coordinated by a unitary leadership than were their opponent, the whites. Despite this total lack of military experience, lack of, Lenin's colleague Trotsky proved to be an inspiring and an effective commander and the chief, he was the chief of the Red Army, which he created in record time. The Reds had a big advantage in that they controlled most of the interior of European Russia, including the major cities of St. Petersburg and Moscow and the rail networks that served them. The opposition armies separated by vast distance from one another were often at cross purposes, did not trust one another and had little coordination in either military or political goals. Moreover, the whites were decisively defeated in the propaganda battles in which reds played up the white generals multiple links with both the old regime and the landlords, which again, if you wanna take your landlord's property and the reds say, hey, those white uh, army guys, they're with them, then you're gonna hate them too. Personal rivalries also damage the white leadership. So that's what is called infighting. So here's a map here, this darker area is area under the Bolshevik control, which again, you see the big city of Moscow, uh, Petrograd, right? And uh, anti-Bolshevik is this area. So again, they're spread far and wide where the Reds are centralized, right? Russian Civil War sidebar, 1918 and 1921, the map of the Civil War shows the advantage of holding the interior lines of transport and communication, as well as the two leading cities, right? Important stuff, kids. Uh, consequently, the summer of 1920, the Reds had defeated the whites and controlled most of the country. All right. The intervention of several foreign powers in the Civil War also became a Red asset, although it was intended to assist the whites. In early 1918, fearing that the Bolsheviks would take Russia out of the war and that material meant for the old Imperial Army would fall into the enemy hands, the French and British sent small forces into Russia. Inevitably, these forces clashed with the Reds and the foreigners, including a small US detachment in the far north, began actively assisting the whites. Overall, the foreign invention provided little practical help for the whites, but gave the Leninists an effective propaganda weapon for rallying support amongst the Russian people saying, say, look at this, those, those uh, white army guys, the foreign countries are trying to help them. So they hate Russia too. So that makes people fight even stronger for their own country, even if their cause is not good. So I have a question in the civil war area. So let me get to the whiteboard again. Question five, easy peasy one, short and sweet answer. You guys can't get this answer, I'm gonna cry. Okay. How long did the Bolshevik Civil War last? So all my funny guys, um, you wanna say something like, I think it was 125 years, you know, that's what it did, I don't know. Or maybe it was a couple of days, I think maybe seven days and then people got hungry and they went back to McDonald's to get their jobs back. No. So go ahead, take your time on that. So question five means we're half done on the questions.
Okay, I think you got that because that's a shorty, shorty and sweetie. Get the eraser. How long did the Bolshevik Civil War last? My last student said, I think it was 30 minutes. Okay, there you go. Okay, back to the material. Now we're into the economic revival and internal struggles. By the summer of 1921, the Bolsheviks were close enough to victory that they abolished or canceled their coercive war communism, the label they used for rule at the point of a gun, which means you will do what we say or else. But you have to give it an official title so it doesn't sound as bad as what it really is. Lenin had employed this method since 1918 through the Red Army and the Cheka. Remember, that's the beginning of the KGB, KGB, secret police. That uh, feared was feared throughout the world, actually. And it had sustained the Bolshevik rule, but only at great cost. Along with the terrible famine, which is when people are starving and the disruptions of civil war, War communism had reduced Russian gross national product, or GNP, to an estimated 20% of what it had been in 1913. So it's like, even if for some reason you're, you're happy with the new communists, usually for the hope of what they're lying to you about, you have to realize, man, these people died of famine and struggled. Look how high their GNP was only five years prior. So like, that's why it says, it came at a price, or actually prices. In place of war communism, Lenin now prescribed the new economic policy, NEP, which encouraged small-scale capitalist business and profit seekers while retaining the commanding heights of the national econ economy firmly in state hands. By this time, the state hands meant Bolshevik hands, right? Communist, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, CPSU, headed by Lenin and his colleagues was in sole or only control of both economic and political affairs. In 1922, all other parties had been banned. Of course, that's what they do when communism takes over. There is no free speech and other agreements or disagreements. There's only one party. And Russia was fast becoming a totalitarian state. Again, one leader, one law, no Congress going against him. After being wounded in an attempted assassination, Lenin suffered a series of strokes starting in 1922. Power in everyday affairs was transferred to an inside group of the Central Committee called the Politburo, translating into English the Political Bureau. This group included Lenin's closest colleagues, Trotsky was the best known and seemed to hold the dominant position uh, within the party's innermost circle. But when Lenin died in January 1924, without naming anyone to succeed him, a power struggle was already underway. So it doesn't matter if he was the favored one. Other people want the power and they're going to fight for it and kill. One of Trotsky's rivals was Joseph Stalin, 1879. To 1953. A tested party worker since early youth, he was esteemed by Lenin for his administrative abilities and hard work. At the end of his life, however, Lenin had turned against Stalin because of his rudeness and his contempt for others' opinions. Perfect guy to run a communist party because he hates other people's opinions. That's only his opinion. Lenin was too late in reaching this conclusion. Stalin, as the party general secretary or administrator, had already cemented or glued his position in. Brilliantly manipulating others, Stalin was able to defeat first Trotsky and then other contestants for Lenin's position in the middle to late 1920s. By 1927, he was the leader of a majority faction in the Politburo and thus the Communist Party. 
1932, Stalin was becoming dictator of the Soviet Union's entire public life. Uh, by 1937, he was the undisputed master of 180 million people. See the law and government box for more on Trotsky. Under the NEP, the agrarian and the industrial economy had made a stunning recovery by late 1928, okay, another 10 years later, from the lows of the early post-war era. The peasants were apparently content and producing well on their newly acquired private farms. Industrial production exceeded that of 1913. To foreign businessmen interested in Russian contracts, it appeared that the Bolshevism's revolutionary bark was much worse than its bite. One could, after all, do good capitalist business with the Soviets, but only a few months later, the entire picture changed. Kind of reminds me of what happened to Cuba when Castro decided to become fully communist. Okay, so I've got uh, two questions in there. Question six. Oops, better if I spaced my words. I'll take many out, be kind. Okay, let's see what I can do with this and the stretching. Hmm. I think I'll leave that there. It looks pretty good there. So the question there is after Lenin suffered strokes, his power was transferred where? What governmental agency took over? Okay, question seven, because I said I had two. So you just name me the company there. Here we go. Let me try to make this a twosie. Yeah. Uh, which person eventually took control of all of Russia after Lenin died? Okay. Let me know. Let me give you a few on those. Getting hot again, so I'll turn the air on. Okay, 
you think you got those? All right. Let me move on. Eraser time. Okay, repeating after Lennon suffered strokes, mild heart attacks, as they say. His governmental power was transferred where? I think it was transferred to the LAPD. Sounds like Temujin talking. And seven, which person eventually took control of all Russia after Lennon died? Was it Joe Biden? Was that who it was? We'll have to find out. Maybe Hillary Clinton. All right. Let's go back to the material. Okay, now we get into Stalin's five year plans. Interesting stuff. The five year plans. As Stalin command, the first five year plan of 1928 to 1932 was adopted. It would transform the Soviet Union in several ways. The Stalin Revolution had started. Russia was still an overwhelmingly rural or country agrarian farming society, backward in every way compared with the Western Europe or the United States. Throughout the 1920s, some party members had been discontented with the two steps forward, one step back, concessions of the NEP, which we talked about earlier. In their view, the good proletarian workers in the cities were still at the mercy of the reactionary peasants who fed them. Very little additional investment had been made in industry, which was seen as the key to a socialist society. Yes, socialism needs industry. In the fall of 1928, many of the more prosperous or successful, well, financially successful, peasants decided to hold back their grain until they could get better prices in the state controlled markets, not free markets. Stalin used this perceived betrayal, so that feels they betrayed him, as a reason to start the drive for agricultural collectivization and rapid industrialization. So they would lose their power and control over their own grain to the government which would go on at a breathtaking pace until World War II brought it to a temporary halt. Stalin's five-year plan was intended to kill three major birds with one enormous stone. The age-old resistance of private land holders to any kind of governmental supervision would be broken by massive pressure to collectivize. A huge increase in investment would be allocated to heavy industry and infrastructure such as transportation and communication systems to modernize the backward society. And the organization and efforts required to achieve their first two goals would enable the total integration of the citizenry into the CPSU controlled political process. Okay, here's a painting. Re revising history, Stalin at Lenin's funeral. There's Stalin there with a the big mustache. Lenin had a mustache and a goatee and was balding. Uh, Stalin had a full head of hair. Uh, with no other rivals for the Communist Party leadership in the picture, what does this imply? Then he doesn't have any competitors, no stress. Okay, so that means we start the agrarian collectivism, but I have a question for the five-year plan. Question eight. Oops, missing a letter. Okay, stretch this. Okay, 
I do a Tuesday? Yes. Uh, list the three major things of Stalin's five-year plan was destined to destroy. So these things were destined to destroy which things, okay? Let me give you a bit on that because you got to list three. Okay, you almost done on that. I know you got a list three, so I'm trying to be kind here. Okay, you're about there. All right. Raise your time in this. So again, list of three major things of Stalin's five-year plan, or it could be three major points. And what were they destined to destroy so that they could be accomplished? Okay, or the five-year plan could be accomplished. All right. Back to the material. Now we start with the agrarian, which means farming, collectivization. And what that means is that the government takes all your land, everybody's land. In 1929, Stalin began his collectivization campaign as a way to win the class war in the villages in the countryside. That is the alleged or supposed struggle between the poor peasants and those who were better off. The richer peasants, kulaks, were to be disposed by force. force. The poorer peasants were to be forced onto newly found collectors' farms under party supervision. So more work for you folks. As many as 10 million peasants were estimated to have died, shoot, in the collectivization drive between 1929 and 1933 most of them in an artificially caused famine. So Stalin had a great idea. Why do I want to fight with these folks? I'll just create a famine and they'll die off. I don't have to lose that many soldiers. Determined to break the peasants' persistent resistance, Stalin authorized the use of the Red Army. See, then later you get the Red Army, as well as armed party militants against the villages. Millions were driven off their land and set out of their houses and condemned to wander as starving beggar. So one minute you own property and land, the next minute you're forced off by guns, and then you find yourself homeless running the streets. Their former lands, machinery, and animals were turned over to the new collectives. The enormous farms, which were run like factories with wage labor by party bosses. Unfortunately, they proved to be inefficient largely because the peasants heartily disliked their new situation. Of course, they were promised many things from Stalin and uh, did not receive them. They're basically back in the same situation, working like dogs and being poor. And they also felt these peasants little responsibility and even less incentive to produce. Like, why should I? Throughout the Soviet Union's history, agriculture remained a major weakness of the economy. The collectivization struggle left deep scars and it costs were still being paid a generation later. St 
Stalin rammed it through because he believed it was essential if the Soviet Union were to survive. The ignorant conservative peasants must be brought under direct government control and their numbers reduced by forcing them into a new industrial labor force. Both of these goals were eventually reached, but at a price that no rational economist could justify. Okay, so I got a question in there. Just one. Question nine, that means we're almost close to the end here. This is a little longer question for me, but the answer will not be long. Oops, sorry. Let me get my word is correct. Stretch this. The agrarian collectivism campaign was a way to do what? What did they want to accomplish? Let me know. Go ahead. Hey, you think you got that? Cool. Eraser. Repeating the agrarian collectivism campaign was a way to do what? Right? Back to the material. Industrial progress. Stalin's second goal was rapid industrialization. Here again, the costs were very high, but their justification was easier. Soviet gains in industry between 1929 and 1940 were truly impressive. In percentage terms, the growth achieved in several branches of heavy industry and infrastructure was greater than any other country in history has ever achieved in an equivalent period, almost 400% even by conservative standards. But again, what does that matter when millions of people died? Whole industrial Cities rose up from the Siberian or Central Asian plains, built partly by forced labor and partly by idealists who believed in Stalin and communism's vision of a new life. Throughout the economy, fulfilling the plan became all important. Untouched by free market realities and constraints, the Soviet managers plunged ahead in a wild race to raise total production. The new industry turned out capital goods, not consumer items. Consumer goods such as clothes and baby carriages became more difficult to obtain and their prices rose ever higher throughout the 1930s. When a suit of clothes could be found, it could cost the equivalent of four months wages for a skilled worker. Could you imagine that? You're a high level worker and then to buy one suit will cost you four months of your salary? How could you pay rent or buy a house or buy a car? Such items such as refrigerators automobiles and mush washing machines uh, were out of the question. So no way, Jose. Even basic food had to be rationed for a while because of the drop in production caused by the collectivization. It is a testimony to the extraordinary capacity of the Russian people to suffer in silence that so much was accomplished at such high cost 
with so little reward for those doing it. The uprootings and hardships caused by the industrialization drive in the 1930s uh, were nearly as severe as those caused by collectivization in the countryside. And Stalin's slave laborers, slave laborers performed much of the work on the new mines, canals, logging operations, and other projects. By conservative estimates, fully 10% of the 1930s Soviet gross natural product, uh, GNP, was produced by prisoners of the NKVD secret police, one of the several successive names for the Soviet political police. So I have one question in the industrial process. Question 10. Easy peasy, straight question. You probably answered this quickly. Now I can make this a ones easy. Oops. Oh, I lost the opportunity. Darn it. Okay. What was Stalin's second goal? Go ahead. Go at it. The second goal was to be drafted by the Lakers and play with uh, LeBron James. Okay. No. Okay. So, you know, it's an easy peasy one. All right. So, there you go. 10 is gone. Okay. So, for my very last part of the reading, yay. Okay. The Stalinist dictatorship. So, they're describing how it was. The third goal of the five year plans was, in effect, a revolution by Stalin and a changed Communist Party against the Soviet people. So, uh oh, that's not good. In 1928, Stalin was, a, was chief of a CPSU that was still an elite or high-level organization. It was relatively small, about 6% of the adult population, and difficult to join. The party was tightly disciplined and composed of intellectuals, white-collar personnel, and some workers. It included very few peasants and few women above the lowest ranks. Uh, communism has never been great for women's struggles. Many members uh, still knew little of Stalin and were totally unaware of the secret high level struggles for control in the Politburo. Stalin emerged as the boss on his 50th birthday in 1929 when a tremendous fuss was made over his role as Lenin's successor. From this time on, no one else in the Soviet hierarchy was allowed to rival Stalin in press coverage or authority. From the early 1930s, every party member lived in Stalin's shadow. He proved to be a master of mafia style politics, never forgetting who had helped and who had hurt him in his climb to power. Absolutely vindictive, which means holding grudges towards political rivals and enemies. They were the same to him. So you just could be a rival. You, you weren't really his enemy, but he's like, no, you have a difficult, different belief than mine. Uh, you're my enemy then. His character has long fascinated many Russian and foreign analysts. Stalin cultivated an image of mystery. Unlike his fellow dictators, he had no gift for speech making. And he never indulged in the dramatics that some other dictators constantly employed in their public appearances, like Benito Mussolini or Adolf Hitler, whose people were mesmerized by their speeches. After 1935, he was rarely seen in public and then only under totally controlled circumstances. So they have to stage it to make him look good. Although he was a Georgian by birth, there is a state called, or a country called Georgia. It's not, they're not actually ethnic Russians. Stalin became a strong Russian nationalist and soon transformed what had truly been a supranational movement under Lenin into a Russian one. He took the international communist organization called the Comintern, Communist International, and based in Moscow, and turned it into an organ of the Russian foreign policy. No foreign communist dared to challenge the policies dictated by Stalin's stooges on the governing board of the Comintern, even then, or even when, as sometimes happened, 
those policies were directly opposed to the interests of the Communist Party in the foreigners' country. In the communist world, Moscow alone called the tune. Okay, we are done with the reading. Okay, we are done with the reading. And uh, I have one last question. Gotta sneak one in there. I know. Because we had an extra reading. I usually give you 10's a limit, but uh, gotta do 11 today. Doesn't mean I'm gonna give you more in the final, don't worry. That's gonna stay the normal size. Okay, try to pack this into a toozy. Okay, uh, what was the name of the international communist organization? So go at it, I'll give me a few for that. Being cold again. Turn that off. Mm, you guys should be excited. It's the end of it. Hey, you think you got that? You just have to give me the name. That's it. Okay, there we go. Going for the eraser. So again, just give me the name. It's a one word name. So what was the name of the International Communist Organization? Not the one for Russia, but the one that espoused their ideas outside of Russia. Okay, so hit the stop share. So you see me again. Hey, how's it going? All right. So. Until we meet the next time, which I'll have to find out because I think the school will be closed on the 6th, which is Labor Day. But you will know probably before me. So either I see you next week or in two weeks. So till then, take care and stay healthy. Okay, bye-bye.